Let's just continue uh, with our meditation on the Sermon on the Mount. We are now in chapter 6 of St. Matthew's Gospel. And here in chapter 6, Jesus wants to compare uh, the righteousness that was accepted uh, under the covenant of Moses and the holiness that he wants from his own disciples and the children of the kingdom of God. So comparing these two, are, you are actually comparing two different levels. Uh, now the word that they use in Hebrew for righteousness is sedekah, and uh, the wise one uh, was the one you would associate with Sedek. Uh, he's the wise one. Um, so Jesus wants to say to us that this is just a hidden attitude inside of your, your own being. This is going to reflect itself in all your religious actions and in your relationships with others. And what he starts with is prayer, fasting and almsgiving. Well, the reason for this is that Jesus is speaking in a Jewish context and their definition of holiness was prayer connects me directly with God. Fasting puts me in right relationship with myself and almsgiving puts me in a right relationship with my neighbor because if my hand is open to them, it cannot be a fist. So their idea of righteousness keep your relationship with God right, the relationship with yourself right, and the relationship with your neighbor right, which means the hand is open in almsgiving. And that's fine, even in its definition that I've given to you, uh, except that you must have the right intention. So Jesus said, be careful that you do not parade your good deeds. Your good deeds are your deeds of righteousness uh, before men to attract their notice. Now to attract their notice means wrong intention. The only intention the Lord really accepts from us is that whatever we do, whether it's prayer or fasting or almsgiving, that we will do it with the right intention, which is that to love God and to love our neighbor because the whole of the scriptures are based on these two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor. You see, for example, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, uh, that as soon as Adam uh, broke his relationship with God, it was in chapter 2, it was followed by murder. Sorry, in chapter 3, it was followed by murder in chapter 4. You break the relationship with God, you break the relationship with the neighbor. It is our relationship of prayer with God that enables us to be able to relate to others correctly. So Jesus says, if the only reason why you're praying is to make an impression on others, forget about it, it's not prayer. God isn't connected to that at all. Um, he said, you lose all reward with your Father in heaven. So it's the same when you, when you give alms, do not have it trumpeted before you. Uh, this is what the hypocrites do in the synagogue. Now, a hypocrite is, is not a word we use very much nowadays. It actually means an actor. And Jesus is referring to uh, people with high jobs in the Sanhedrin and in the priesthood in Jerusalem who would have all the right garb, they would have the right job, they'd have the right position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, God and the people, but their hearts mightn't actually be right. And this will come out more and more in Matthew's Gospel as we proceed. And so he says, if that's all they're doing, they're just like actors on a stage. There's no reality uh, to that. So he said, if you're doing it to win people's admiration, oh, there's, there she is and she's a holy person. Forget about it, he said, delete. It has no value whatsoever. Um, I tell you solemnly, they've had their reward, which means your Father in Heaven is not engaged at all. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't really look at it. Just do it. Let this spontaneous act of love come out from the depths of your being. Your alms, alms giving must be secret. That means you're not doing it so that anybody else can see it, but you're also not looking at it yourself. You're just reaching out in love uh, to somebody else. And your father that sees what is done uh, in this secret place, he will reward you. 
And what Jesus is looking for is real holiness, not just prayer, fasting and almsgiving, not just church going, not just attending liturgies, but the real thing, which is a proper relationship with God and a proper relationship with your neighbor. And so he continues then by introducing prayer, the, the most basic relationship we have with God. Uh, and he says that when you pray, uh, you're not to imitate the hypocrites. Now see again, that you could, you could be saying prayers and there's nothing going on uh, because you're only acting out a part. Um, he said, they love to say their prayers standing in the synagogues and in the street corners for men to see them. I tell you solemnly, he said, which is a very uh, powerful expression of Jesus, they've had their reward. In other words, there's no connection with heaven. They're looking for people's attention, they get people's attention and that's the end of it, but there's no prayer. And so he gives his famous definition of prayer in Matthew 6.6, 6, which I always do this way, Matthew 6.6. 6. And I've done that with very small children as well and they'll always remember Matthew 6.6. 6. Uh, and that is, he said, you interiorize, you go into the depths of your being. Um, he said, <clears throat> when you pray, Go into your private room. Now, the most private room you have is your heart and then into your, the deepest level of your spirit uh, and shut the door. The door is your eyes, your ears, your mouth, the way we communicate with others. Shut that off. Enter into the depths of your being where your father is there and pray to your father in that secret place. And your father, who sees all that is done for you, uh, sees, sorry, your father who sees what you are doing will reward you. Now what does a father reward his child with? And that is love, relationship, care, paternity. In other words, your relationship with God absolutely develops when you have sought God. Now I have done this with children in different countries, very small children, and they respond very, very well to going inside shutting the door and entering in and children from all nationalities all backgrounds we all have exactly the same need to touch this in this deepest place to touch the presence of God um, and so the uh, intention is important now Jesus isn't actually saying something that's completely new to them because the prophets also told the people that their intention was very important uh, in coming to God and in doing anything for God. Uh, Isaiah said, for example, with regard to prayer, that before they call, I will answer, and while they're yet speaking, I will hear them. Now that's like a parent who hears the child actually trying to wind itself up to ask the parent for something. And Isaiah said, if your relationship with the Lord is right, that's the way it's going to be with him. And so, uh, then he decided to give us his own prayer. And Matthew 6 verse 7 says, in your prayers, now the you all the time is those who have joined me in my kingdom, who have joined my family and all of us together can call God Father. You're the people I'm talking to. I'm not talking to the people in the world who don't understand. In your prayers, he said, you are not to babble as the pagans do, for they think that by using many words, they'll make themselves heard. Now, Jesus is addressing a problem that not only existed in the ancient world, but still exists. And that is that people think there's something special about saying a long prayer, that it must be holy if it's long. And he says, no, it's holy if you touch the Father, if you actually make contact, then it's holy. So this is me and this is him and we make contact. That is prayer. That's like a child climbing up on uh, her, her daddy's knee and just cuddling in to the father and letting the father uh, really squeeze the child tight to himself. And there's this wonderful connection, words or no words, that connection has been made. That's prayer. That's what Jesus is saying. So it's not the multiplicity of words that you use that's going to make an impression. He said, do not be like them. Now, very, very seldom 
does Jesus of Nazareth ever say, do not. He usually comes at things much more gently than that, and he says, do not do that. You'll make no impression at all on God. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So he wants to, us to go to the father like trusting children. And once we make that connection, the father knows everything you need much more than you do yourself. So he said, you should pray like this. And for 2000 years, the church has not prayed like this. We've simply repeated the words. Amazing. And praying like this is fundamental to our relationship with God. Jesus said, the first thing you do is approach him as Father, our Father in heaven. In Hebrew, Father is Av, and Avinu is our Father. Now, Av means my origin, where I came from, the one who brought me into existence. And if we come to God as my origin, the one who brought me into existence. Since he brought me into existence, he wants everything that is right for me. And he wants me to reach the fullness of life. So if I connect back into my origin, then he is going to enhance my life in every possible way. So Jesus said, recognize your family connection. Recognize your family connection. Connect, put the, the, the plug back into the socket so that the electricity can flow. Make sure you make that connection. Um, and so the focus of the Our Father is Him, not us. And it's heaven, not earth. And so the Lord turns our attention completely towards Himself and towards heaven. He says, Father in heaven, now the problem of the vast majority of people on this earth is that they're looking downwards, they're looking to the earth. The earth has no answers, it only has questions. The earth has plenty of problems, but it has no solutions. And if we look to the Father in heaven, he has all the answers and he has all the solutions. So our choice in prayer is either to look down and multiply the problems or to look up and magnify the Lord. And we have a wonderful uh, example in our Blessed Mother who magnified the Lord and uh, allowed him, because she connected with him so deeply, uh, to use her to bring the solution to the planet Earth, which is to bring the Saviour to the Earth. So our Father in heaven, may your name be held holy. Now, people today in the 21st century don't seem to plug in to the meaning of your name must be held holy. But if you go back into the Hebrew scriptures, they, to this very day, the Jewish people call God Hashem. That means the name. And it means the name that is above all other names, the name that is so holy that it's unpronounceable. Uh, that is the name that must be held holy. And Jesus was not the first uh, to say that this name should be held holy. Let me read a few things for you from the prophets. Uh, well, first of all, let me start with Leviticus chapter 19, verse uh, 1, where God said uh, uh, to Moses, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. In other words, I want you like me, because if we're to be in relationship, we have to be alike. Isaiah uh, 29, verse 23 uh, says, for he, uh, for he, Israel, shall see what my hands have done in their midst. He shall hold my name holy. They shall hallow the Holy One of Jacob, and they shall stand in awe of the God of Israel. And in chapter 8, verse 13, Isaiah says, It is the Lord of hosts whom you must hold in veneration. Him you must fear, him you must dread. So this holding God 
in veneration, your name must be holy, shows our basic relationship with God. So if our prayer is to be the prayer of Christ, and this basic relationship of reverence and awe and fear and wonder, fear in the correct sense of awe and wonder and humility before God, if that isn't there, the prayer isn't there. The, the right relationship isn't there. And so it's the very first thing that Jesus did was he directed our attention to heaven and said that you must know who it is that you're speaking to. I mean, if you had a, a, an interview with the, the, the Pope or an interview with somebody terribly important in government or whatever, you'd show respect and, and uh, so on and reverence before that person, whether you agreed with them or not. And how much more this must be in our relationship with the Father. And Jesus says, this is basic to our connecting with God. I must know who he is and I must know who I am. And if I know those two, then I'll know how, how that relationship actually works. So your name must be holy, your kingdom come. Now the issue in uh, the Our Father uh, it's nothing to do with us, it's to do with God's kingdom. Because Jesus came on earth to bring the kingdom of God onto the earth, so that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, God's will hasn't been done on earth as it is in heaven. People make an attempt to do God's will, but it's the way we want to do it. And it's within the parameters that we put on it. So when Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was putting the reason why he came on earth into our prayer. That was the very reason why he came. And those simple words of Jesus actually contain the whole of the Old Testament because uh, Adam and Eve had God's will reigning in them before they decided to go in the wrong direction. But when they fell, then they took the whole of the human race towards the human will against the divine will. And the battle that you see in the whole of the Old Testament is the battle between the human will and the divine will. And this battle has brought huge disaster uh, on planet Earth. And so Jesus put the prayer into the heart of the church so that every member of the church in every branch of the church everyone who would call themselves by the name of Christ, that they would say this prayer every single day. So that by now we have a whole era, 2000 years, a huge bank of prayer has gone back to God, asking him to bring his kingdom on earth so that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if God's will is done on earth, then the very best thing will be done for every single person. The very best thing will be done for every family, every unit, every tribe, every people, every nation. There will be peace on earth. God's will will bring order and beauty and harmony to the earth. So we should pray that God's will will be done with great fervor. Uh, and what the Lord wants is that uh, we who say we truly love him, uh, that we should consciously ask him that his will would come back to the earth. Uh, and it's only when all of the real issues are dealt with that the Lord adds, you know, a few things for us. Very interesting. So uh, the second half of the Our Father, it's nearly a, a PS, you know, I'm adding this. Give us today our daily bread. <clears throat> now we've dealt with God the Father. And once we've dealt with God the Father and his will and his kingdom, now we come to us. And our survival on planet Earth depends on three breads. The bread for your body, the bread for your mind, which is the word of God, and the bread for your spirit, which is the Eucharist. And the Lord has provided all three. Now here at the beginning, of the gospel, the, the Eucharistic gift is still in the future. But Jesus puts it into the prayer because uh, we will be, the church will be praying this for all time. So give us today 
our daily needs. Now, it's a father that we're talking to, and so the father knows not to stay with the body, and not even just to stay with the body and the mind, but to feed body, soul, and spirit so that we're completely and fully alive. The glory of God is man fully alive. So he wants uh, this to be done. And then he adds something which we can find a bit difficult, and that is, uh, forgive us our debts the way we forgive other people their debts. Uh, he puts in a clause for us which is extremely important and that clause is forgiveness. Forgiveness is um, one of the most important responses that we give to life because everybody is wounded uh, and in their woundedness and in their uh, their pain, they hurt, we hurt each other. And we say and do things that, that damage each other. But the way to heal all of that is forgiveness. And forgiveness is to let the person go free completely. Not to hold them to it, not to take revenge, not to take them to court and get money out of them. It's to actually set them free. Now, human nature doesn't like that uh, right now. Uh, we prefer to get even and uh, teach a person a lesson and all this kind of stuff. But forgiveness is the, the heroic face of love. And it's so important that Jesus adds it on in, uh, in verses 14 and 15. Yes, if you forgive other people their failings, your heavenly Father will forgive you yours. But if you don't forgive them, he won't forgive you either. Now, I call that spiritual cholesterol causes spiritual heart attacks. If you don't forgive, you have totally blocked your relationship with God. And I've met people in many countries who say, well, my prayers are not answered. And I say, but do you forgive? If you want your prayers answered, you forgive. That unblocks the relationship with God. Make sure you forgive. And Jesus told, it will tell us uh, further on in the gospel that we have to forgive 70 times the seventh time. That means continuous forgiveness is necessary if life is to continue on this earth. That's the only way it can do it. And so it's locked in there uh, into the Our Father. Okay. And then he, he adds something strange, and that is, and do not put us to the test, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, all of us are tested in life uh, and the testings of life are very important to enable us to overcome and to deal with life and to um, deal with life successfully. Um, you're never meant to, to fail a test. I mean, when, when, when teachers give tests to their children in school, they're utterly shocked if the child doesn't pass the test after all the preparation I've given to you. God does not give us a test um, to get us to fail the test. It is that in the Our Father that we're being asked, uh, we're asking him that if the test comes to us, that we will actually succeed. But in Matthew's account, it's slightly different to Luke's account of the Our Father. Uh, the test is the eschatological test at the end of time for the church, when the church will be tested horrendously and the evil one will be the Antichrist. And for most generations living uh, in the time of the church, they're able to say, Lord, save us from that particular test. Let me live my life before the Antichrist. But of course, some generation has to face into it. Uh, and that generation who has to face into it will have had the whole church praying every single day that they would pass the test. It's actually very important. Now, I've just given you the shortest possible summary of the Our Father, simply because I have to give you the whole gospel. Uh, but this is the uh, most astonishing prayer. Uh, it's absolutely uh, amazing. And what the Lord is saying is very simply, keep your relationship with God open, healthy and right and keep your relationship with your neighbor open, healthy and right. And it isn't just almsgiving, you've got to actually send them positive love for their failings.
because that's what Jesus was doing all the time during his lifetime. He was forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. And you see, it's one of the last things he does from the cross as well. Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. And you know, the amazing thing is that most people who hurt us don't realize what they're doing either. They're only eating out in pain. Thank you for joining us. Sláin agus bánach dé live. Goodbye. God bless you. The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization, of promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel, the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope. The hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals, but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work. Shalom World, God's own channel.